Hello there. This is where the fun begins. And yes, I know those are two quotes that aren't from Rise of Skywalker or even the sequel trilogy, but I really like them and they're fun and everybody on the internet knows them, so whatever, they're in here. Title card. I don't think it should come as any surprise that a lot of people, critics and audiences, were not happy with Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker. It's not that it was the worst Star Wars movie ever made or the worst movie ever made. It just was a disappointment, kind of meh, really a bummer. And like, thank God Endgame was any good, because can you imagine if the Star Wars finale, the Game of Thrones finale, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe finale all stunk in the same year? Anyway, I get suggestions for a Star Wars Episode 9 rewrite more than any other video by far because that is something that a lot of people want. They want a good finale to Star Wars, the Skywalker saga, the sequel trilogy, something that is both like fun and entertaining, delivers on the themes of the original, presents some new ideas, something that's just satisfying in a way that's not just fan service, but would contain fan service, but is satisfying as a story. So that is what I'm going to do. In this series, I'm going to rewrite Star Wars Episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker, although that's not what we'll call it. We'll get to that. There's going to be four parts to the series. First part is going to be covering Act 1. The second and third parts are covering Act 2, split in half by the midpoint. And the fourth is Act 3, the climax of the movie. This will also serve as a kind of introduction to the three act structure and screenwriting at a really high level. Just give you an idea of how a movie is structured. So not only am I going to explain my movie, but I'm going to justify my changes a lot of the times by explaining how they fit into the structure of a story. And it's fitting because A New Hope is one of the most well structured movies. It is always one of the examples that shows up in the screenwriting book, so it should make sense that I can take that structure and apply it to a future Star Wars movie. So if you're like, should I watch this four part series of YouTube videos for entertainment? You're not just being entertained, you're learning something, let's say. It's fine. And structure isn't 100% necessary, but it does help. One thing I want to say before we get going, and something that I always do with this rewrites, and I genuinely believe, I do not think that maybe rewriting a more successful version of Star Wars Episode 9 means I am a better writer than J.J. Abrams or Chris Terrio. Say what you will about either of them, they have put together some really excellent stuff. J.J. Abrams wrote Super 8, which is fun. He also wrote Mission Impossible 3, which was a really good relaunch of that formula. It gave Ethan Hunt a meteor role by exploring his day-to-day -day life and his relationship with his wife. And it introduced Philip Seymour Hoffman's Owen Davian, who is without a doubt the best villain that series has produced. Also, J.J. Abrams created the Star Trek reboot. And while I'm not a huge Trekkie, I am a big fan of fun, well-paced action adventure movies. And I think Star Trek 2009 was that. I mean, it is one of the first times I can remember in a theater an audience just spontaneously applauding. Not at the end of the film because, like, they enjoyed it. Just a moment gives them an emotional reaction that they have to respond to with applause. In that movie, it was when the Enterprise comes in and saves Spock. So J.J. Abrams is great. On top of that, Chris Terrio is a very accomplished screenwriter. He won an Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay for Argo in 2013. So clearly he knows what he's doing. I both have the benefit of hindsight and I don't have to deal with studio notes, directives, budgetary constraints. I mean, this is Star Wars. I usually kind of blame the producers for mistakes in movies. Yeah, a lot of the times because they're an easy target and a lot of the times because producers make bad decisions. But I mean, this is not only the finale to the sequel trilogy, which are some of the highest grossing movies ever made. This is apparently the finale to the Skywalker saga. So like the expectations on this movie are humongous. And I cannot imagine how many future properties were tied up in this and how many just studio directives they had to deal with. Making a movie is an incredibly complicated process and it is a miracle that any movies are any good at all. Think of this as just a fun exercise, especially in the middle of the current entertainment dead zone. And I mean, this can also function as what is called headcanon, where you didn't like the original story, so you kind of replace mine in your head with that one. It's something that a lot of people said they did after my Justice League rewrite, so this can be that too. But this isn't me saying I'm a better writer than J.J. or Chris Terrio or any of the people behind Star Wars. So I also want to discuss some objectives. 
First one, from a storytelling perspective, I am telling a new story here. This is not the same as Star Wars Episode Nine, with a couple of changes. If you want to see those, I've already made two One Small Change videos about Star Wars Episode Nine, one about Chewbacca and one about how the series could have ended. So those exist, but this is a completely different story. Now I am going to develop some of the themes that were set up in previous movies that Star Wars Episode Nine also developed, but I mean, like that's inevitable because I'm working with the sequel trilogy as it currently exists. Luke is dead, Kylo Ren is evil, all of our heroes are together. I'm also going to keep most of the new characters that were introduced in episode nine, although I might make some changes to how those characters work, but Zori Bliss, General Pride, Janna, D.O., Babu Frick, the alien that says, okay, those are all going to continue in this story. The only character that will not show up in this story is Palpatine because I have absolutely no place for him. I think he has absolutely no business being in this story. So don't expect any Palpatine. No offense, Ian McDermott. I love the performance in this movie. Love the energy. Apparently you did some Fortnite voiceover. I bet that was fun too, but not in this version. Last thing, because this is headcanon and I have absolutely no idea where this series is going in the future, like I don't know if they're going to make new movies with these characters, I'm sure they'll pop up in comics or other books or video games or TV shows or something like that, but I'm not going to make any big changes to the end of this movie either. Characters that survive will survive, characters that die will die, there'll probably be a change or two, but you know, for the most part, good will prevail and evil will not. In Different ways though, different ways. So I didn't completely spoil the whole thing for you just there. With that being said, let's get to it. So we're starting with act one. Typically this act is all about setup. We are introducing, or in the case of a sequel, reintroducing our characters, settings, themes, conflicts. This is also where we're gonna set the tone for the movie and act one should end with our heroes leaving a place that is relatively safe to venture out into a place that's relatively dangerous in act two. And that's going to start by establishing the ordinary world. We have to give the audience some expectation of what the baseline is, even if that's different from previous movies. We're going to make a paradigm shift that is going to change the way everything's been working so far. So to do that effectively, we need to explain how everything's been working so far. The first scene should also be bold and exciting and hook your audience and Star Wars is great at these. The first scene from A New Hope is one of the best examples. Even the first image of the Star Destroyer following Leia's tiny ship, like that is incredibly memorable and sets some really huge stakes for that movie. This gigantic empire is chasing a small group of rebellion heroes, like that works so well. And this first scene is also going to be about setting tone. How does this movie feel? How is it different from The Last Jedi? Because like with Star Wars Rise of Skywalker, there's going to be some sort of time jump. Mine's going to be like a year or two years, but time will have passed and this movie will be different. Characters are approaching their end game, so they're going to be making bigger and bigger moves. The intro can also be a good place for exposition. Thankfully, Star Wars is in an amazing spot with this because they have the crawl. Movies like Black Panther or Lord of the Rings usually have some scene where someone will voice over say, oh, when the universe was created, there were all of these different tribes and races and they all had to fight this guy and they split up and that is fine and that works when it works. But like not only is the crawl a very good, concise way to present that information, not only do people not mind it, people would be furious if a core Star Wars movie did not have the crawl. So it's a great way to throw in some exposition. Here's the crawl for the Star Wars Episode 9 rewrite. Oh yeah, and this is probably a good time to tell you the title of my Star Wars rewrite. It's Star Wars Episode 9, The Spark of Hope. So for the title, this one is actually an interesting one. I wanted to go back and see what the other Star Wars movies were titled. And I was looking at their crawls and I realized Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens, actually contains the phrase, The Last Jedi in its crawl. So it's kind of like Ryan Johnson got the title for his Star Wars movie in the crawl from the previous Star Wars movie, which makes sense because you're building on those themes or some of those ideas. So I'm gonna do the same thing. And when looking through the Star Wars episode eight crawl, I found the phrase, a spark of hope. And that's kind of what we're gonna be dealing with here. Our main characters have stated that they want to be the spark that lights the fire that burns the first order to the ground, so now they're that spark. Let's see if they can actually burn the First Order to the ground. Okay, so that's my title. Star Wars Episode Nine: The Spark of Hope. Okay, 
Here's the crawl. Oh, also, I'm not going to read the crawl because that's not how the crawl works, but I also am not going to be able to license the Disney Star Wars theme because I am not a a very rich person. So instead, I'm going to sing the tune to a song that may sound like but is legally distinct from the Star Wars theme. Here we go. Ba 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 bum 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 that worked. In the opening scene for the Star Wars Episode 9 rewrite, which I am so excited about, it's one of the first things I wrote, will be the execution of General Hux. There's absolutely no place for him in this story. And Star Wars Episode 9 understands that and gets rid of him, but it does not do it quickly enough. It gives him this very unnecessary subplot with a dumb reveal. I made an entire video about why it doesn't work. But in this movie, we are going to start by executing him. It's going to show that Kylo Ren is making moves. He's taking things seriously. And he doesn't have time to deal with characters who may have been serious threats in the past, but have been relegated to basically a joke. So the movie opens with General Hux and a Knight of Ren. This one will be Aplek. Yes, I'm going to use the Knights of Ren, and I'm going to use the specific Knights of Ren to do specific things. In this case, Aplek makes sense because he's the one with the axe, and if you want a better idea of what these guys look like and what they do, I guess look at the comics and the visual dictionary because that is not present at all in the actual Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. So Aplek leads Hux to a chopping block. He says, you have committed crimes against the Empire, including treason, the punishment for which is death. How do you plead? And General Hux is going to be defiant to the end. We're going to give this character a cool send-off. So he's going to say, oh, where is he? Is he too scared to come to the execution? Won't do anything himself? Relegates all of his work to his little Knights of Ren? And then Kylo Ren will show up, not in person, on a screen or as a hologram. And he'll say, like, do you have any last words, General Hux? And General Hux comes back with this big, angry speech about how everything that the First Order ever accomplished was because of him. Everything Kylo Ren is doing is a distraction. Kylo is obsessed with this ancient religion and the girl, and he's going to be the ruin of the First Order, so might as well save General Hux some time and get it over with. Kylo Ren's like, is that all? General Hawk says, you are no Snoke, you are no Vader, and you are no supreme leader. You are a coward. Kylo Ren says, no, I'm busy. And then he raises his hand up, and Aplex axe raises out of his hand, and then it just cuts General Hux's head off. Cut to another scene. So this is going to be the introduction of Director slash General Pride. So Director Pride, dressed all in white, a lot like Krennic because at this point he is a scientist. He meets Kylo Ren in a boardroom. He's incredibly starstruck. Oh, Kylo Ren, it's an honor. I fought with your grandfather at the Battle of Kylo Ren's like, I don't care, I don't care. Will this thing that you've created work? I believe so, although I've never tested it on something that powerful. And Kylo Ren says, leave that to me. All of your equipment is in the ship now. Don't fail me. General Pride says, never, Supreme Leader. And then we zoom out to reveal that they're on this gigantic ship, which is the new home of the First Order. So those are your stakes. Kylo Ren is making moves, he is serious, and he does not have time for General Hux, and neither do we. So now we're gonna move on to our inciting incident, also known as the call to adventure. The question is like, what is new and different? Usually this signals a paradigm shift from the ordinary world. So at this point we're still there, but this is going to be the thing, the external problem that our heroes need to solve. So this is gonna start with our first big action scene, which I've decided will take place on Batu. Originally, this was just a nondescript Star Wars planet in my outline, and then I was looking through, like, what planet can it be? And I realized Batu is the planet that was created for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, and it is a nondescript Star Wars planet. So, I mean, I have nothing against cross-promotion when it's not incredibly intrusive, so screw it. Let's set it there. 
So we're gonna start this scene following three First Order Stormtroopers just on patrol through the city to give us a layout of the area for an action sequence that will take place there later. We'll see other First Order Stormtroopers on patrol. The streets aren't incredibly dense. Give you an idea of what the world is like here. People are scared. The First Order has taken over. The city's kind of ground to a halt. And the three of them end up at a door where they meet a shopkeeper. And the shopkeeper is some weird alien. He says, uh, oh, I didn't think you guys would be coming so soon. And they say, we've moved up the plans, is that a problem? He says, no, 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 come on in, come on in. I'll get it from the back. So they all walk into this shop, and he comes out with a box. We don't see what's in the box, but one of the stormtroopers says, Kyber. And he says, yep, refined. It's really hard to do. I found one of the only places that can do it. And they say, well, will it do what we need it to do? And he says, I wasn't told what it was going to do, and they say, you weren't told, and he gets a little confused, he says, no, uh, also, there's a little bit more in the back, so I'm gonna go grab it, so he goes into the back, and then the stormtroopers get a transmission, but it's from Rose, and she's on the Millennium Falcon, she says, guys, we have a problem, and then the stormtroopers take off their helmets, and they reveal that they are heroes, Ray, Finn, and Poe. Now, why are they taking off their helmets? I don't know. They just are. We have to show the audience that it's them, and it's hard to communicate that without actually showing their faces. So, whatever. I mean, the shopkeeper isn't in the room anyway. Poe says, what's going on up there? Rose says, I think you guys might have been made. We just picked up a light speed jump approaching the planet. Looks like a buzzard. I think this is Ushar's ship another Knight of Ren. And because the Knights of Ren aren't just six identical guys, they are different characters, they are Kylo Ren's field generals, the team kind of reacts to each one differently because they've heard different stories about them in the past. I mean, like, even in the visual dictionary, these characters are incredibly different than they're portrayed in the movies. Like, some are supposed to be more cunning, ruthless, they use the force differently. One is a weapons expert, I'm pretty sure one is a sniper. So if Kylo Ren were, say, fighting them all at the end of Episode 9, it does not make sense that they would all just rush him. One would probably run away and try to get a sniping position. But, I mean, they don't have any characterization in that movie, so who cares? But in this movie, they do. So Ushar is the one with the mace. It's a weapon that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the lightsaber. Who knows if he'll ever end up actually fighting one of those. Maybe he will in, like, 10 seconds. But that's the character that shows up. So they say, okay, what are we going to do? Ray says, I can deal with him if he finds us. What should we do until then? Rose says, stay put. We're going to chart a new course. We'll pick you guys up. You guys, uh-oh. Uh and then Finn says, uh-oh. She says, yeah, we just got a second light speed jump. Looks like this one's Kurik. Kurik in this movie, another Knight of Ren. He's kind of the best pilot in the group, so he's going to be tough for the Millennium Falcon to evade. Rose says, uh, we're going to figure something out. Just hold on to the shopkeeper and we'll catch up with you. Poe says, yep, that should be fine. Oh, and then we hear the shopkeeper leave on a speeder bike. Poe says, ah, nothing, it's fine, we'll deal with it. Just tell us when you're close. So we have our first big action sequence. It's a chase through a Star Wars city. This is pure Star Wars, and it's, yeah, it's kind of reminiscent of Star Wars Episode Six, where Leia dresses up like a bounty hunter to try to rescue Han. We're gonna have a similar scene here, where our heroes dress up as stormtroopers, try to complete a mission, and now our heroes have to evade the Knights of Ren, while they also have to catch this contact who took the Kyber with him. First thing that happens, they get stopped by some of the other stormtroopers on patrol. Finn holds back. He's, they say, hey, uh, it looks like you guys have a problem. They say, no, 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 we already called it in. It's fine. We're, we're dealing with it. They're like, are you sure here? Wait a second. He's like, no, 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 no. It's fine. It's fine. So he's kind of stalling while Poe and Ray are going to go and try to catch this guy. So one of the first fun things we got here, Ray is going to be doing like force parkour, almost like Aladdin in the beginning of Aladdin, jumping over buildings, landing on awnings. And She's just going all out to catch this guy, while Poe gets on his own speeder and speeds through the streets of the city. And right as Rey is about to catch up to this guy, Ushar gets right in the middle of him. It's our first big cool Jedi vs. Knights of Ren conflict. We're going to show that Rey has gotten a lot better. She's been training in the last couple of years. But the Knights of Ren aren't pushovers either. Ushar has a special weapon that can block lightsaber attacks and he's doing a lot of damage. And eventually Rey is going to get the better of him and win. At the same time, Poe is doing a high speed speeder chase through this city to try to catch this person. Now we're going to cut back to Finn for a very important interaction. He's going to still be stalling with these stormtroopers, and eventually he's going to try to run away, 
they're gonna catch him. He's gonna put his hands up, turn around. They're gonna say, take off your helmet. So he like takes it off slowly. He's very scared. One of them says, FN2187. The other says, Finn, the deserter? I thought you were a myth. He says, no, it's, it's me. He says, you destroyed Starkiller base. You killed Captain Phasma. He gets really scared. You're a hero. And he says, well, I, I didn't actually kill Captain Phasma. The ship exploded and that probably killed her, but I helped. And they say, oh my God, this is amazing that we're meeting you. We've wanted to get away from the First Order forever. Can you take us to the Resistance? He says, I think so. I just have to, and then they are both shot. Both of them killed. They fall over and just die. And we see Poe in the speeder bikes like, come on, Finn, we gotta go, we gotta go. And Finn's like a little shaken by this says they were surrendering and Poe says I, I didn't realize I just saw them they'd cornered you in the alley come on we gotta get on Ray needs our help so Finn gets on the speeder they speed away they catch up to Ray we have this fun exciting chase where Chewie and Rose are piloting the Falcon and the slug who I love the slug by the way that just seems to work on the Falcon and does nothing I want him to be a major character in this movie he's gonna be the engineer who's like the Scotty of the Falcon he's using multiple arms that are coming out of his body a couple are like pressing buttons on a computer some are pulling levers just physically holding things in place so this guy is like plugging every hole in the wall and eventually they're going to escape. The heroes get into the Falcon and they go through an asteroid field or something that Kurik can't follow them through. And then they do their light speed jump. So that is our first action sequence and that's our inciting incident. Not only is Kylo Ren finally making some big moves, but the big move involves Kyber and specifically refined Kyber, which we'll explain in a second. The next thing that's going to happen is something called second thoughts. So in a screenplay, usually after the inciting incident in this call to adventure, our hero has a moment where they consider the call and even sometimes refuse the call. It usually exists as a break in the action. After we've set up the external conflict, we're going to look at the internal conflicts. What is it about our heroes that is going to make solving the problem difficult? So first is Poe, who is very upset. And he's like, oh, Rose, I need to take the wheel of the Falcon for a second, just like get my head together. She says, yeah, that's fine. So this is Poe's first mission as the actual leader of the Resistance, and he failed a lot. Yeah, they got a clue about Kylo's plan, but their contact escaped. They got ambushed by the Knights of Ren, and on top of that, he did something that made his best friend Finn really upset. So Poe is questioning whether he can even be a leader at all. Next, we have Finn. Rose will go over and talk to him, say like, hey, what, what's going on? And Finn will say, you know, I've been at this for a while. I've been with the Resistance. And when I left the First Order, I thought that I was doing it because I wasn't okay with killing innocent people. And I don't regret that decision, but now I'm wondering if I'm just not okay with killing. Like, I never quite found my place here. Maybe it's because war just isn't for me. He hadn't really thought about the human toll of war before. Like, we know that the First Order Stormtroopers, like Finn, are captured child soldiers. So of course Finn would feel guilty about killing any of them, because they all could have been him. Maybe with the right moment, they would have all been able to join the Resistance too. And maybe this war just isn't the right place for Finn. We can finally challenge one of the core concepts in Star Wars, which is the idea that war and killing and fighting is a morally justifiable way to solve problems. I'm not saying it's not, but Finn is going to question that. Then we've got Rey. So Rey just has no idea what to do. Rey always dreamed of being a Jedi and being trained by Luke Skywalker, and now Luke Skywalker is dead, and she's relatively directionless. Leia is her mentor, but she doesn't know nearly as much about the Force as Luke did. Without the guidance of Luke, Rey doesn't know what it means to be the last Jedi. Like, that is an incredible responsibility to put on someone's shoulders, and she hasn't had nearly enough training. All of the training she had was on that island in Octu, which was for like days, and everything else she's gotten has been in these books. Yeah, Leia's been able to mentor her and help her a little bit, but she's not nearly as skilled in the Force as Luke was. So Rey just doesn't know what her next move is and doesn't believe she's going to be strong enough to defeat Kylo Ren. She has a little chat with Leia over a hologram or Force Skype, maybe, and Leia's like, what's wrong? And she's like, I just I just don't know if I can do this. I don't know if there is a way for me to defeat Kylo Ren. Leia says, 
the way to defeat Kylo Ren is to look past him. I know that's complicated. I'll explain when you get here. So Rey is having a lot of issues dealing with the pressure of being the last Jedi. And then we'll check in with Poe and Chewie. This is going to be our introduction to the new Resistance base, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. Chewie roars in Wookiee speak. Poe says, I know, I know, he's probably aware of it, but it's the safest place for us to be. Chewie roars again. Poe says, the ionic cloud should protect us. It surrounds the entire planet, and it makes getting into the planet incredibly difficult unless you've already done it. Chewie makes one more Wookiee sound. I would make it myself, but I, like I can't do the, the Wookiee roar. It's like, oh, yeah, no, can't do it. So <laughs> Poe says, buddy, it's okay. Plus, we don't have a lot of friends now, so we kind of got to take what we can get. And they fly through the ionic cloud, and he says, plus, you can't beat the view. And that's when we'll get a first look at the new base of the Resistance, which is on Bespin in Cloud City, Lando Calrissian's mining colony. Now, I don't think there is an ionic field that covers the planet, but we need a reason for it to seem like an actual safe place to be. So I'm going to say in the last couple of years, one has shown up. Who knows? Maybe all of the mining created it. But regardless, that's where everybody's hanging out. So they land the Falcon in Cloud City, and everyone goes into a meeting with the entire Resistance Council, who is, at this point, all of our surviving main characters. So Chewie, Lando, Connix, Snap Wexley, Maz Kanata, Neebnub, Aftab Akbar, the droids, and a bunch of other funky-looking aliens. And here they discuss the mission. So I want someone to be kind of confrontational here, and let's say it's Akbar's kid, and he's like, what happened? I thought you guys were going to get the contact. And Poe says, we tried, it was difficult, we got intercepted by some Knights of Ren. He says, oh, so I guess your contact was wrong, it was an ambush, and Poe says, I did my best, I don't know what else I'm supposed to do, we have to go after every lead. This is the first time anyone's seen Kylo Ren in years. And Rose says, plus we did find something. Apparently, they're using something called refined kyber. Snap says, kyber? Ray says, kyber is a force-sensitive crystal. It's what powers our lightsabers. Leia says, and the rumors were it was what powered the first Death Star. Matt says, but refined kyber. Ray says, I've never heard of kyber being refined. I didn't even know it could be. Connix asks, do we know where he refined it? Ray says, no, but when he was talking about it, he did mention that it was very difficult to find somewhere that could actually refine Kyber. So I don't know if that helps narrow down our search. Lando says, it actually might. There was that job we did a long time ago. What was the name of the planet? Chewie, do you remember? Chewie does a roar. Lando says, that's right, Savarine. It's a refinery planet and they handle all kinds of strange stuff. One of the best in the galaxy, and they do a lot of work off the books. If they didn't refine this Kyber, they know who did. So Poe says, all right, that's useful. So we'll send a team to Savarine, but then they're interrupted by, and this is something I do constantly. I think I did it four times in the Justice League rewrite. They are interrupted by an alarm. Connick says, we've got ships, a lot of them just breaking through the eye on a cloud. Poe says, that shouldn't be possible. How many of them are there? Connick says, there's at least 50. We have to go now. So this is our first plot point, also known as the lock-in. This is the moment where everything changes. It's some sort of paradigm shift. Characters can no longer go back. They're forced to make decisions and move forward. It's usually a big moment. Sometimes it's a disaster, like a big action sequence to drive home the consequences. And here it's going to be the attack on Cloud City. The First Order is going to destroy the last safe place the Resistance has left. And the crazy part is, they shouldn't be able to. Something is off. But our heroes don't have time to figure out what that is. So first thing that happens, Lando gets in the Falcon. Rayfin and Poe want to take the Falcon, but Lando says, no, they will be looking for the Falcon. I'll take it as a distraction. Hopefully, I'll be able to get some of them off your tail. And he'll say like, but I need a co-pilot. And then Neebnub will volunteer, so Lando and Neebnub will fly the Millennium Falcon again. They're good friends now because of their mission back in Episode 6. And they're kind of the saviors of the galaxy. So like, let's let them have a hero moment again. But then our legacy characters are kidnapped. So Leia, Chewie, Akbar's kid, and then even like Connix, Maz, Snap, all of them are captured by the First Order. Some of them are shot, but they're not killed. The shots are actually surprisingly precise. 
in a way that you don't usually see from stormtroopers. Like this isn't a firefight or anything like that. It's just a couple of shots that knock everyone out. Not killed, but knocked out. Especially Leia, who decides to stay back to give our heroes more time because she knows she's a target of the First Order. They will not kill her and that'll be a good distraction. So then our heroes all go to another hangar and get ready to leave. They get on an inconspicuous starship. And in this hangar, there are 30 inconspicuous starships that look exactly the same. And they all get ready to leave, and then we realize that Rey isn't with us. And they kind of try to contact her. They're like, Rey, where are you? And she's like, I have to get something. This is a little bit of drama because everyone wants to leave, but Poe's like, no, 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 we have to wait for Rey. And at the last minute, Rey shows up, and the thing she needed to get was the Jedi texts. These are really important to her. This can kind of bug Poe. Poe's like, I just almost sacrificed all of these lives so you could get your books. And Ray's like, I need these. You don't understand. These are very important. So then everybody leaves at the exact same time. This is a new plan that the Resistance has come up with, which I think is kind of clever. Everybody leaves in the same ship at the same time because now that there's hyperspace tracking, it's really difficult to evade the First Order unless it's unclear what ship you're even tracking, and it's easy for a ship to get lost in the shuffle, so hopefully this will give our heroes even more time. And now they go to Savarine. So our characters have crossed a threshold. They are further isolated. They were forced to leave all of their mentors behind. And now they're stuck together, which is definitely going to force some sort of confrontation, especially between Poe and Finn. And they are forced to go from Cloud City, a place of relative comfort, to Savarine, a potentially dangerous planet that none of them have been to before. And that is the end of Act 1. In Act 2, our heroes will attempt to infiltrate Savarine and figure out what the First Order is after with their refined Kyber, all while dealing with their own internal issues and evading capture by Supreme Leader Kylo Ren. And we'll cover that in Part 2 of the Rise of Skywalker rewrite. Oh, and one more thing. I'm sure you noticed in the middle there that I made a Star Wars-ish looking opening crawl to give the exposition for my Star Wars rewrite. Well, I made that crawl, even though apparently there are a lot easier ways to do that, but I made it in Adobe After Effects, a program that I used to not even kind of understand, and now I even kind of understand it because I learned the basics of After Effects from Jordy Vanderput's class, Learn Adobe After Effects for Beginners, on this video sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning. With so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives, Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. There are classes in productivity, design, writing, video editing, and so much more. Another one I always recommend is fellow YouTuber Thomas Frank's class called Productivity Masterclass, how to build habits that last for becoming more organized and productive. Skillshare offers classes designed for real life so you can move your creative journey forward without putting life on hold. You can learn and grow with short classes that fit your busy routine. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable, especially when compared with pricey in-person classes and workshops. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. And if you want to join the millions of people already learning on Skillshare today, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in this description will get a two-month free trial of premium membership so you can explore your own creativity, explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity with Skillshare's online classes. What you find might just surprise and inspire you. So I hope you guys are enjoying this. It's going to be a really fun series. I think you guys are really going to like it. If you really like it, I would definitely consider subscribing to my Patreon at patreon.com slash nandoviewmovies. You can join the ranks of these fine people over here. See your name on screen, get access to videos early, watch the Patreon exclusive monthly whiteboard videos, vote on the whiteboard videos, suggest topics. You can even be part of the Patreon exclusive Nando V Movies comic book book club that we do every month. This week we're doing Marvels, which I've never read before, which I'm really excited for. You can find all that at patreon.com slash Nando V Movies. Please think about it. You have no idea how much I appreciate it. Also, listen to my podcast, Mostly Nitpicking, where every week me and my friends DJ and Diggins pick apart a piece of pop culture by looking exclusively at the details. 
In the past, we've even done an episode on Rise of Skywalker that if you like people just kind of picking apart Rise of Skywalker, I think you'll find pretty entertaining. You can find it wherever you listen to your podcasts. We are at NitpickingPod on Twitter. And last thing, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, if that's still a thing when this video comes out. And very importantly, on Twitch. Twitch.tv slash NandoVMovies is where I stream games. I've been streaming the Avengers game. It's a lot of fun. A lot of you guys are there talking to me and it's just awesome. I play stuff like Fall Guys. I'll probably end up playing Among Us on that soon. So follow me on Twitch. Think about subscribing. There are subscriber exclusive emotes that are a lot of fun. It's, it's, all, it's all great stuff. That's all I've got. Stay safe and I will see you next time for part two of the Rise of Skywalker rewrite. Thank you.